G. E. Moore's The Nature of Judgment is one of Moore's most important contributions to the developing philosophy of the 20th century in the wake of Kant. You can see as G. E. Moore works over the nature of judgment that he's trying to incorporate something important about Kant, that, namely Kant's overcoming of Hume's psychologism, that is, basing logic and knowledge on contingent psychological facts, but trying to avoid the idealist tendencies that follow in Kant's wake. From this work, we derive one of the most important themes of all of analytic philosophy, which is what is a proposition. According to Moore, Kant's real contribution to philosophy is to set the stage for this question and to move philosophy into a new domain, focusing on the question of the nature of the relationship between language and world. Indeed, analytic philosophy is still broadly Kantian in a particular sense, namely in its revised conception of the a priori. If we want to boil things down and make an admittedly overgeneralization, but a helpful one nonetheless, we can think of all of 20th century philosophy as the search for a new a priori, one that would take on board what Kant said in a way that refutes Humean skepticism, ushered in a new understanding of the a priori according to which what a priori knowledge does is it involved in hooking us up to the world. Whereas with the pre-Kantian rationalists who thought that a priori knowledge was knowledge of special objects, metaphysical objects that go beyond sense experience, Kant re-baptizes the a priori as that which gives us, gives our mind purchase on the sensible world itself. But as with any philosophy, there are problems involved in Kant's conception. So we have two different streams of 20th century philosophy going in different directions, taking Kant's lead, grabbing certain things from him and dispensing other things. On the phenomenology side, the a priori forms of the intellect are involved in the synthesis of sense experience. So they, Husserl, for example, keeps Kant's notion of synthesis. We're using a priori categories, the very structure of the intellect, to bring sense experience, bring the manifold of sense experience together into a coherent whole. The analytic philosophers dispense largely with Kant's notion of synthesis, and they take the a priori to be a character of our language and our logic. Still, the a priori is involved in linking language up to the world. Moore's influence on analytic philosophy in this regard is, comes out very clearly in The Nature of Judgment. Notice where Moore says, what Kant really shows is that space and time and the categories are involved in particular propositions. And this is a work of greater value than a deduction from the possibility of experience would have been. So he's getting rid of synthesis synthesis of sense experience and telling us that what Kant really showed with his a priori stuff is something about the structure of language and logic propositions. This is known as part of the linguistic turn in philosophy where philosophy's primary obsession becomes the nature of the link between language and world. Moore begins by identifying an ambiguity that he finds in his idealist teacher F.H. Bradley with Bradley's use of the word idea. Indeed, sometimes Bradley uses the word idea to refer to the act of thinking and sometimes to the object of thought. The act of thinking is my actual mental state of thinking something. The object is my what I am thinking about. So what's the relation between my mental states of thought and the things that I'm thinking about? For example, right now I'm thinking about G.E. Moore. Now, of course, G.E. Moore, the object of my thought, is not the same thing as my current mental state of thinking about G.E. Moore. So Moore's right to carefully distinguish between these two. So Moore is pondering the nature of the relation between the act of thought and the object that one thinks about, 
Moore is trying to push back against the idealist interpretation of this relation. On the idealist version, the reality consists of acts of thought. The objects that we are thinking about are somehow dependent on the acts of thought. So the actual object of our thought is merely abstracted from the real act of thought. That's a picture of reality on which what is real are, is thought, and the objects of our thought are somehow dependent on our mind. That's the idealist position par excellence. Moore is trying to dispense with this picture. Moore is trying to find a view on which the objects of our thought are independent of our acts of thinking. It's just like this marker. This marker was purchased from the store and it was sitting in a warehouse. There it was, totally independent of my act of thinking about it or perceiving it. And then I happened to come in and perceive it. I might never have thought about this pen. No one might have ever thought about this pen. Still, it would have existed independent of all of those acts of thought. So we need to get rid for more of the idealist picture according to which the objects of our thought are somehow based in our acts of thought, are somehow dependent on our acts of thought. So he's pushing for a view of the objects of our thought such that those objects are mind independent. To push towards this conception on which the objects of our thought are primary and our acts of thought are secondary, he puts pressure on the idealist theory in two directions, finds two faults with the idealist conception of the act-object relation. First is the argument from infinite regress of acts. He says, in order, to know, in order to think about something, I have to know what it is I'm gonna think about. I can't think about the Pacific Ocean unless I have some sense of it. Of course, I can develop a more full sense of it over time, but I need to have somewhere to start. So in order to think about the Pacific Ocean, I need to know something about the Pacific Ocean. Now, if the objects of our thought are dependent on our acts of thought, or an abstraction from our acts of thought, then ultimately to initiate an act of thought, that means I need to have a knowledge about a prior act of thought. That means for each act of thought, in order to get it going, I need to have knowledge of a previous one. But to get that previous act of thought going, I had to have knowledge of a previous act of thought, and so on and so forth. This is gonna end up in a, for more vicious, infinite regress. The way out of the regress for more is to just say, that's wrong, the act of thought is not primary, objects of thought are not abstractions. The second problem that Moore finds with the idealist picture of the act-object relation is the argument from shared content. He thinks that the idealist can't explain how two numerically distinct acts of thought, say my act of thought about G.E. Moore and your act of thought about G.E. Moore, could share the exact same numerically identical object. Moore asks, what explains the fact that you and I can both think about the same object in distinct mental acts, or indeed one person can have the same thought in two distinct instances. I can think the very same thought today and then again tomorrow. What explains the mundane fact that different acts of thought can have the same object? Is it something about the nature of the act of thought as the idealist would have to have it? Or is it something about the nature of the objects of our thought as Moore is pushing towards? Well, of course, Moore is gonna say, it's gotta be a fact about the object of our thought. Why? He says, look, if we're gonna use the act of thought to explain the commonality between two thoughts, say A and B are two different acts of thinking that have the very same content in common. If we're going to appeal to acts of thought to explain that, then we're going to need to appeal to some act of thought C. Now, either act of thought C has something in common with A and B or it doesn't, if act of thought C has something in common with A and B, then we're back where we started. We're gonna to need to invoke act D to explain that commonality. D will either have something in common with C or it won't, and then we'll have to invoke act E, and on and on. We're again 
down the rabbit hole of an infinite regress. Now if C, the act we're invoking to explain the commonality between A and B, has nothing in common with uh, A and B, then we're not in an infinite regress, but act C does nothing to explain the commonality. So either we have an infinite regress of acts or nothing is explained. Therefore, we need to appeal to the properties of the objects of thought independent of acts. Therefore, there are objects of thought independent of acts. Therefore, idealism is incorrect.